summits are all about leader to leader things. So let me start with a simple one. How are things these days between you and President Xi? Canada, of course, is in uh, a challenging time in our relationship with China. Uh, we know uh, that uh, the experience we went through with the arbitrary detention of, two, of the two Michaels uh, set uh, a real challenge into our relationship. But at the same time, we have worked together uh, on uh, issues that matter. At COP15 in Montreal, we brought the world together with ambitious goals uh, on protecting nature and fighting climate change. So uh, we will work with China where we can. In other areas, we're going to be competing uh, with China for uh, trade share, for diversification of uh, Asian economies and building uh, stronger critical mineral supply chains, for example, uh, that are directly competing with areas in which China has dominance. And the other thing that we're going to do is continue to challenge China uh, on areas we fundamentally disagree around democracy, around human rights, uh, around respect for the rule of law. Um, it is a complex relationship with China, but Canada will continue to both stay strong, anchored in our values, and look for opportunities to contribute to economic growth and opportunities for Canadians. Okay. Next question. Steve Chase, Globe and Mail. Would you describe Xi Jinping as a dictator? <sighs> look, China's a one-party state. I don't think anyone would call it a democracy. In 2013, you described uh, China as a basic dictatorship. Mr. Xi was already in charge. Mr. Biden, uh, President of the United States, which is our security guarantor, also called him a dictator. Why won't you call him that? Uh, listen, uh, we can get into uh, all sorts of different uh, uh, definitions. The fact is, he's not running a democracy. It's an authoritarian state. What you just heard is a clip of Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau during a press conference in which he was asked about Canada's relationship with China, and specifically his position on whether China is or isn't a democracy. Trudeau makes his position quite clear in this interview. Our guest today begs to differ. In this episode, we'll be joined again by Carlos Martinez to discuss his incredible book, The East is Still Red, Chinese Socialism in the 21st Century. Carlos Martinez is an author and political activist from London. His first book, The End of the Beginning, Lessons of the Soviet Collapse, was published in 2019 by Leftward Books. He's a co-editor of Friends of Socialist China, a co-founder of No Cold War, and a coordinating committee member of the International Manifesto Group. He writes regularly in The Morning Star, The Global Times, China Daily, and CGTN. I highly recommend you check out his work. In this second part of a three-part discussion on China, we'll be delving into how China operates as a socialist democracy. We'll be going into what that even means, what are examples, what are some accomplishments, and how does China's socialist democracy differ from what I'm sure most listeners are familiar with, which is Western liberal democracies. This show is 100% listener funded and a solo production, so anything you can spare will go a long way in, in allowing me to continue this project, which requires, of course, research, editing, recording, and other work to put together. So if you do wish to contribute, you can go to patreon.com slash AES the podcast. And if you become a Patreon member, you will gain access to a variety of bonus content and episodes. So shout out to my patrons. If you're unable to contribute in that way, no problem. You can help out by sharing this episode by following us on Twitter at AES the podcast. You can also subscribe to the show on your preferred podcast platform to get new episode notifications. Also, of course, feel free to leave a review if you have the time and even just a star rating. I recommend checking out the back catalog too when you have the chance. And as always, you can really help the show by engaging local worker struggles in whatever form that may be. So let's get into a bit of myth busting. China is presented as being undemocratic in the West. Pretty much any article, news article, will mention something about the lack of democracy or the opponents of China are pro democracy, meaning that China itself is anti democracy. They say this for, from what I understand, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, the same reason that socialist countries in the past have been depicted or presented as undemocratic. Um, which is that they don't follow the format uh, or structure of Western liberal democracies, such as having a, a multi-party system where different parties can be voted in power. Of course, in China, there is the, the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, which is um, the, the sole governing party. Um, Long-time listeners of the show will be familiar with our discussions about what democracy means or what it can mean. But could you kind of answer and clarify for us, is China democracy? And if so, how does democracy function there differently than in other countries? 
I mean, you know, as you've alluded to, in the West, we've come to accept a very specific version of democracy as the definition of democracy. And it's capitalist democracy, so-called liberal democracy, with a multi-party parliament and universal suffrage and emphasis on the protection of private property. We consider that as a sort of universal truth, right? And it's a fundamental dividing line in global politics. Like that's the rhetoric of the US, of Canada, of Britain, of the EU, etc. is that these countries are democracies and other countries that don't follow this system are authoritarian states. I'm guessing we don't need to go into like the flaws of that whole narrative that, you know, actually these are capitalist democracies and you can choose between two capitalist parties, both of which will represent the interests of the capitalist class. And power can pass from Labour to Conservative or from Democrat to Republican. But there's an incredible continuity, a remarkable continuity when it comes to actual strategy, actual policy. And Xi Jinping said something really nice about so-called liberal democracy a couple of years back. He said, you know, if people are awakened only at voting time, but they're dormant afterwards, and if people hear big slogans during elections, but have no say after, if people are favoured during canvassing, but are left out of it after elections, then that's not a true democracy. Any sensible discussion about democracy kind of has to be prefaced with a recognition of this, the limitations of this whole narrative. And and we have to understand that any kind of democracy is always a reflection of one or other kind of class rule. China has got a democratic system, like it's a very different democratic system, and they call it a whole process socialist democracy. It's a system that's grown out of the experience of of the Chinese revolution, it's, you know, in, and in that sense, it's unique to Chinese socialism, although uh, I think it's, it works in a very similar way to, to Vietnamese democracy. And in that sense, like it's a system that's developed out of the need to generate mass participation in the revolution, in capturing power, in building socialism. And then from 1949 on, from protecting and expanding socialism, uh, it's very much aimed at the broadest possible participation. You know, the system of National People's Congresses operates at every level, you know, like what we see in the news is the two sessions every year in, in Beijing, which is the top level where you have the National People's Congress and the Chinese People's Political Consultative, Consultative Conference. But then that parallel process happens at the provincial level, at the city level, at the town level, at the village level. It's a representative democracy. So people are elected and selected to positions of representation. And there's absolutely one thing that's interesting about it, and one thing that's much more democratic than Western systems of democracy, is that money has got absolutely nothing to do with it. You can only get elected, you can only achieve a position of any kind of authority if you've got a strong record of serving the people. Like There's no way you can get to the standing committee of the Politburo of the CPC without having, you know, basically run a province of, you know, maybe 100 million people and have a great record of, like, making millions of people's lives better. I I remember talking to a friend who works at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and this was while Trump was in power in the US, and she was just saying, you know, like, someone like Trump, who's got to where he's got to on the basis of being a billionaire, there's no way someone like Donald Trump could become president of China Someone like Donald Trump couldn't become a village prefect in China because he's got no record of making people's lives better. And that's the the basis on which our representative democracy works. Beyond that, there's a lot of public engagement. There's huge attempts to kind of increase popular participation in the democratic running of the country. Like the, for example, if you look at the the five-year plans, which is what you know, China's economy is based on uh, at a high level in terms of indicative planning and all the rest of it. You know, there's uh, Roland Bohr, I don't know if you've seen his book, Socialism with Chinese Characteristics, uh, uh, a guide for foreigners, I think it is. He talks about the, these five-year plans as being the crystallization of literally tens of thousands of rounds of discussions and consultations at every level of state, every level of, of Chinese society. And, you know, the other thing to mention is that Chinese democracy is a work in progress. And everyone recognises it as a work in progress. It's not something that's perfect, but it's something that they're continually seeking to improve. Like you've got government departments that are devoted to developing systems to increase participation and improve like grassroots governance. For example, when I was in, I was on a delegation in China a couple of months back. And one of the places we went to was Guizhou, which is one of the poorest provinces. 
And we went to this kind of experimental community called Jinyuan. And it's about 10,000 people. And it's been the, the experiment that they're conducting is in grassroots governance. So like in addition to employees, they've got these teams of volunteers, mainly uh, members of the CPC, who basically kind of devote themselves to meeting residents' needs, fielding opinions, setting up groups for discussion, setting up groups for you know social activities and cultural activities, music and tai chi and art and so on. Lots of space for like self-organized activities. There's a library, there's activity rooms, there's lots of green space, lots of communal areas. Across China, there's thousands of experiments like this. And they synthesize the lessons learned from all of these experiments and turn them into policy. There's a democracy in China, a socialist democracy in China. It's imperfect. It's a product of a million factors, but uh, essentially arises from the Chinese revolutionary process and the, the trajectory of Chinese revolution, China's revolution from 1921 until the, the present day. And it's getting better all the time. And I would say that it involves a much larger proportion of the population and is much more representative than its counterpart in Britain or the US or Canada or wherever. So this is certainly a thread that I've really come to appreciate since I've started doing the show and talking about Cuba, East Germany, every other socialist country and learning about how their mass politics functions, how they engage people through huge consultation processes. They bring in organizations. It could be unions, could be women's organizations. You know, a huge mass consultation recently occurred in Cuba for their family code, where there's thousands upon thousands of meetings um, to get people's feedback and input onto a family code that was eventually passed. And I believe it was also um, on their, their constitution um, amendment a few years um, prior to that. You know, these are things that just they wouldn't happen in Canada or the U.S. We have no input in regards to any policy uh, to that degree. So thanks for providing that clarification on democracy as it exists in China. Kind of, you know, as an offshoot of that, people may claim that, okay, maybe, sure, maybe there's some kind of democratic process in China, but that China as a socialist country isn't really living up to a Marxist presentation or a Marxist infusion of their politics or their policies or their actions. So is Marxism something that is faded into obscurity in China and is just like kind of a rhetorical thing that is maybe brought up like, oh, today is the anniversary of Karl Marx's death. So we're going to like post some article and some picture of me behind a picture of uh, Xi Jinping and, um, and Marx. Um, so how does like how seriously essentially is Marxism taken in China today? Marxism is taken very seriously in China. And I think, you know, there's a pretty, pretty broad recognition that. Marxist philosophy, historical and dialectical materialism, and Marxist political economy, as applied to China's concrete situation at different periods over the course of the last century, has essentially been the secret to China's success. And there's a couple of quotes which I think sum that up quite nicely. First from Deng Xiaoping, where he says that, deviate from socialism and China will inevitably revert to semi-feudalism and semi-colonialism the overwhelming majority of the Chinese people will never allow such a reverse. And then, you know, very similar theme from Xi Jinping a few few years ago, only socialism can save China, and only Chinese socialism can lead our country to development. A fact that has been fully proved through the long-term practice of the party and the state. You know, as to like the study of Marxism in China, like Marxism is very widely studied in China. It's part of the curriculum at your high school level, college level, university level. Most universities have a department of Marxism. Xi Jinping himself has a doctorate in Marxist philosophy. And, you know, you can't reach a high level in the CPC without having, I would say, a pretty profound understanding of Marxism, of Leninism, of uh, of Mao Zedong thought. Marxism's the default worldview, I would say, in China. Um, It's contrary to what the bourgeois newspapers will have you believe, it's a very pluralistic society and all sorts of people believe all sorts of things. Um, You know, you can find Keynesians, you can find Kantians, you can find neoliberals and all the rest of it. It's, as I say, it's a very pluralistic society, but the default worldview 
is Marxism. And certainly no one's like punished for being Marxist. You know, you, you, you don't have a situation where like you do in, in Britain, and I'm sure you do in North America as well, where if you're a Marxist, if you're a communist, or if you're a socialist, it's very difficult for you to get certain jobs like to get a to get a, a teaching job in a university or whatever you you it's almost impossible unless you very effectively hide your views so that's very much not the case in china <laughs> like marxism uh marxism is is helpful for your academic career in china whereas it's a major impediment to your academic career in britain and you know like but you you do have people who say well it's all just a show you know they just like you say, they celebrate Marx's birthday and they devote all these resources to the Chinese Academy of Marxism and to having Marxist departments and all these universities and printing billions of copies of Marxist literature and all the rest of it and calling themselves a communist party. But it's all just it's all just a, a, a show. Um, I mean, you kind of have to ask why they would go to such incredible lengths <laughs> to to generate this conspiracy over the course of 45 years like that that must involve literally hundreds of millions of people um it just you know the, the whole the whole idea just isn't any any sort of credible in my opinion so yeah you know marxism's taken very seriously in china is everyone on the streets constantly talking about marxism does it kind of saturate society as is maybe the kind of stereotype of what a socialist society is like, and, and probably what it was like to some degree during the Cultural Revolution. No, um, you know, most people are just getting on with their lives. But in as much as there's a default worldview, it's Marxism, it's Leninism. Um, you, your point about putting on a show for saying, "Oh, we have our Marxist departments," like we, we, I promise, I swear, we're we're socialist. I feel like it's an allegation that's made of course, at every socialist country on a variety of different things. I was just recently talking to Benjamin Weston and Zoe Andrews. Both of them have held tours or in when, when North Korea was open uh, prior to the pandemic, they uh, led tours through there. And often they would get comments from people on the tours. They're like, oh, I think that that is fake or these people are actors and all this stuff. Um, and it's like, their their response to that was just that, you know, like you're not that special. Like the whole country isn't just putting on this entire show for like 15 tourists to come see on this certain day. Uh, people are going about their lives. People are using the train to get to work. They're not just getting on the train at one stop, and then going back again in the loop over and over again. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting um, argument that keeps on getting brought up. Like I wonder, I'd, I'd be interested to know, like, where does this kind of originate from? This kind of um, fakery suggestion of fakery on the part of socialism we grow up in capitalist societies we grow up in what we consider to be capitalist democracies and we don't recognize that these are hegemonic societies where bourgeois ideas uh, dominate are hegemonic and we can't really imagine anything else even though we don't recognize that that's what we live in and, and that kind of defines our whole existence we can't imagine living in a situation where working class ideas or the ideas of oppressed peoples are hegemonic and dominate and, and the, that would create fundamentally different type of society. So we see it and we're like, that can't be real. You know, they're, they're, they're just making it up. No, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, thanks for that. Um, the Chinese government implemented their poverty, their most recent poverty alleviation uh, policy uh, which I'm sure most listeners or many of our listeners know about, <clears throat> in 2015, uh, which attempted to completely eliminate um, absolute poverty in China. Uh, in 2020, um, they achieved this. The government indicated they'd achieved total alleviation of extreme poverty in rural areas under their current standards. Uh, this, of course, was a huge achievement on the part of China, lifting, I believe, 800, 800 million people out of extreme poverty. Um, so can you speak to this poverty alleviation program? How did it function and what were its outcomes? This most recent recent poverty alleviation program, the, the targeted poverty alleviation program was launched in 2014. Uh, at that time, just under 100 million people were identified as, as living below the absolute poverty line. And seven years later, by 2021, that number was zero and and. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has, has recognized this as what he called the greatest anti-poverty achievement in history. 
just in terms of definitions, what does it mean to be out of extreme poverty? It's not only about income level. It does include that definition of $1.90 a day or whatever it is, um, you know, the, the international poverty line, which is obviously not a great deal of money. But China's definition includes that, but goes much further than it. So when they when they started on this program, they said that not only do people have to be above that income threshold, but they also have to benefit from what they call the two, two assurances and three guarantees. The two assurances are for adequate food and adequate clothing, and the guarantees are access to medical service, safe housing, including drinking water and electricity, and at least nine years of free education. So that means that now literally every person in China is guaranteed a certain kind of minimum quality of life whereby they have sufficient food, sufficient housing, clothing, modern energy, like, you know, electricity and or gas piped into their homes, clean, like improved drinking water piped into their homes and access to healthcare and universal education. Even for poor people in China, you know, people who are not in absolute poverty, but who are relatively poor, the rural poor, that puts them in a completely different category of poverty to kind of more or less anywhere else in the developing world, in the global south. Like, you know, my father's from India. I've been to India several times. You go to an Indian village, it's a very, very different category of poverty. Or you go to a kind of a peri-urban slum on the outskirts of Delhi or on the outskirts of Mumbai or whatever. Very, very different category. Uh, you certainly don't, you can't say that people have got two assurances and three guarantees. You know, there are people that seriously suffering from malnutrition, millions and millions of homeless, millions and millions of people in kind of debt bondage, inherited over generations, certainly living without electricity, without clean water, and unable to go to school as well. And, and India's literacy rate is still about 75% as compared with China's, which is functionally adult literacy is about 100% or approaching 100%. When we talk about ending extreme poverty, we're talking about ensuring that every single person is above that threshold where the basics of life have been achieved. And that's really, um, that's really an incredible a historic achievement. In terms of the mechanics of the program, the first step was obviously to identify those living in extreme poverty, and they literally employed 800,000 people, cadres, to visit every single community in the country and to identify those that were living in poverty and to work with them to develop plans to kind of sustainably and permanently get them out of poverty. They then sent cadres to poor villages and communities, and they would do like whatever the situation demanded. There wasn't one kind of particular silver bullet. They were very responsive to people's individual and particular needs. Sometimes that was helping people to form cooperatives. Sometimes that was like linking agricultural producers to e-commerce markets so that, you know, if you're in Sichuan, you can sell your products to Shanghai and Beijing or whatever. It could be home improvement projects. You know, it could be fixing people's pipes. It could be rebuilding walls, ensuring people had access to funding where it was needed and appropriate, ensuring people had access to training and like further educational opp opportunities. They built whole new communities like for voluntary relocation of people who lived in like very remote areas where it was just simply not possible to make basic services available to those areas. Like we can't get you electricity you know, up this mountain, and we can't get you clean water up this mountain, and we can't get you broadband up this mountain, but we can provide you with a pretty nice new home just over here. And and the whole program was has been linked to the project of what they call ecological civilization of you know environmental protection. Uh, so millions of people have been employed over the last few years, given jobs in like restoration and protection of forests and grasslands and wetlands and all the rest of it. And you know, it's just been an amazingly thorough program, and I think is a really nice, positive example of what Chinese socialism is about, because it, it reflects the priorities of the government and the overall orientation of Chinese society. Like, why is a program like this happening in China when it doesn't happen in Canada? It doesn't happen in the US. It doesn't happen in Britain. You know, we wage proxy wars against Russia, and we wage war against Iraq and Afghanistan, Yugoslavia, and so on, or Libya. We don't wage war on poverty. We, wa we wage a war on drugs, which is actually a war on black and oppressed people. But we don't wipe out poverty, even though we've got the resources to do so. 
you can spend a long time walking around Beijing. You can spend a long time walking around Shenzhen or you know any any Chinese city, and you won't see homelessness these days. You can. I live in London, in North London. I can walk. I'm going to say 50 meters from where I live, and I will see homeless people. And if I walk like a couple hundred meters, I'll see a lot of homeless people. Britain's one of the richest countries in the world, but the priorities of the government and the structure of our society is such that that is a problem that doesn't get solved, but it's a problem that has been solved in China. So, and you know, the the last thing on on this subject that I'd like to just mention is that the, the CPC poverty alleviation isn't just from 2014 onwards. It doesn't start with the it doesn't start with the targeted program. Like the CPC has always been very focused on poverty alleviation and improvement of people's living conditions. Like from the beginning, they set up the first liberated zone in the early 1930s where they conducted land reform and they conducted rural collectivization and they got rid of debt bondage. Then obviously in the early decades of socialist construction, like the first three decades from, from 1949 until you know essentially Mao's death or, or in 76 or the start of reform in 78, in bourgeois history, that period of time is presented as a kind of disaster where China was this sort of basket case country. And then finally, at the end of the 1970s, they got, you know, market religion and things got better. But, you know, during those first three decades, China's life expectancy increased from 35-ish to 65-ish. The population pretty much doubled. Healthcare and education were rolled out to the countryside where 80 to 90% of the population lived. They ended famine for the first time in China's history. Like that's <laughs> that's quite a, quite an impressive and quite an important accomplishment. They ended feudal oppression. So, you know, the huge amount of poverty alleviation took place in this in this these early decades of socialist construction. And it was also a key focus of the reform and opening up period. You know, the the core motivation for reform was ending poverty, particularly rural poverty, um, increasing pro- productivity so as to produce you know, to produce more and to create more wealth. And and between 78 and 2013, the number of people in China living below like the international threshold of absolute poverty dropped from 80% to 9, 9%. So, you know, even though that's misleading to a degree, because like, okay, when, when the absolute poverty level was 80% in China at the end of the 1970s, that meant something very different to what it would mean you know, elsewhere in the region, like elsewhere in, like for example, in South Asia, because people had certain guarantees, like you you would have your rations and you had, you had access to land, you weren't in debt bondage and you got free education and you got a lot of social services and, and so on. But still, it was an incredible achievement. So, you know, I would say throughout the 102 years of the Communist Party of China's existence, they've continuously made amazing progress on poverty alleviation. Um, you know, to to add on to what you said, Carlos, uh, I recommend people check out the CGTN documentary entitled uh, "China's War on Poverty." Uh, you can access it on YouTube. Like, it really kind of hits home the success of the program, the um, the amount of effort that went into the program, the the sending out of um, I believe their party members um, out into these rural areas, the specific work, the very um, a, for like personalized work to people's specific conditions rather than just kind of like a blanket. Here's the solution for um, alleviating poverty in this region, getting people connected to um, econ- like not only their own local economy, but the national economy as well, provide technology, free housing. Um, it's really, it's really incredible. I do recommend people uh, check out that documentary. Stay tuned to the third and final part of my discussion with Carlos Martinez on his book, The East is Still Red, where we will be talking about the propaganda war against China.